Welcome to the Phil. I'm delighted uh, to welcome everyone here on behalf of our society, our senior patron, uh, the Provost Patrick Prendergast, and Trinity College Dublin. Thanks so much for coming to welcome the Society's newest recipient of the Gold Medal of Honorary Patronage, Professor Brian Cox. Every year, the Council and members of the Phil uh, elect a select number of exceptional individuals to the honour of honorary patronage in recognition of their outstanding and significant contributions to their given fields. The pop idol turned science idol, Professor Brian Edward Cox, is an English physicist, PPARC Advanced Fellow and a Royal Society University Research Fellow at the University of Manchester. He also works on the Atlas Experiment at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN near Geneva, Switzerland. Born in Lancashire, Cox studied physics in the University of Manchester before completing his Doctor of Philosophy in Energy Particle Physics at the same university. He is most well known to the public as the presenter of science programs for the BBC, especially the Wonders Of series and for popular science books such as Why Does E Equals MC Squared and The Quantum Universe. He has been the author and co-author of over 950 scientific publications. Before his academic career, Cox was a keyboard player for the bands D-Ream and Dare. Without any further ado, we invite you to please stand to welcome the Society's newest recipient of the Gold Medal of Honor Patronage. Thank you very much. I mean, um, and, and thank you for thank you for coming. What a remarkable reception. Thanks. Um, I think mainly that we're, we're going to do a sort of a Q and A session. But I, I wanted to say just a few things. Um, it's obviously a great honour. This when I looked at the the list of people who've been honoured in this way by this society over the centuries. Um, it's a in some sense very unfashionably. It's a list of elites, which is a word that is uh, frowned upon. Um, it, I, I firmly believe, actually, that institutions such as this uh, don't exist to perpetuate elites. That they honour them, yes, they celebrate them. I just walked through the long room, actually. You see the, the, the great intellectual, I suppose, the, the, the people who've d generated the foundations of our intellectual society, the fabric of our civilization, lining the walls. They, they are elites in some sense. But I genuinely believe that organisations like this exist to democratize knowledge and in doing so they're therefore um, well remove the the idea of, of, of elites as people that, that are the I suppose the guardians and trustees of knowledge as I was walking through the long room I was reminded of um, one of my favorite scenes in Cosmos Carl Sagan's Cosmos in 1979 which is um, and actually the scene itself has been criticized widely by historians so it's probably um, apocryphal but it was, a, it was a story that Sagan told, the, the sentiment's very powerful, about the, the uh, destruction of the library at Alexandria, so the great reposity, repo, repository of ancient knowledge. And Sagan made the point that because knowledge was kept within the walls of the, of the institutions, within the walls of the libraries and the universities, when the barbarians came to the gates, there was no one there to defend that knowledge. And much, probably... 90, 95% of the knowledge of the ancients was lost in the destruction of that library. And I think that's clearly a very, I suppose, a serious point that we need to take on board today. Uh, we, we live, of course, in the world of Brexit and Donald Trump and who knows what else. Um, these are the reactions, as President Higgins said, actually, um, which I thought was a very powerful and widely reported um, um, speech last week, certainly in the UK and elsewhere. Um, he said that he identified a climate of anti-intellectualism -intellectual, uh, amongst the insecure and the excluded. He wasn't criticizing the insecure. He was pointing out that they are excluded. And that's why I think that organizations like this are vitally important, because they really are about sharing knowledge, democratizing knowledge. Um, he also said, actually, that education is the key to allow citizens to discriminate between truthful language and illusory, illusory rhetoric, which I thought was very important. Um, we can't take that for granted. 
uh, those institutions like this, I think, um, exist in a sense for times like these, um, when we have to fight the forces of, well, well, well almost, I suppose, the anti-intellectualism being celebrated. Um, that's what institutions like this are really for, as I said, the democratization of knowledge. And I thought I'd finish by, I was looking through some quotes, some of the best pieces, I think, of writing, as far as I'm concerned, about science and uh, intellectual pursuit in general. And so I might be become the first person in this chamber to read from an iPhone, but I apologize for that. <laughs> because it's a, <laughs> I, I think it was very, it, it's interesting. It's, it's written by Richard Feynman. And it's an interesting thing because it was written in 1953. Um, at that time, people like Feynman were very, um, I'm trying to make my iPhone flip it around now. Cause I can't read it. <laughs> people like Feynman were very aware of what had happened only 10 years before. And um, it's been much reported actually, much said, but I think it's very true that uh, today we appear, certainly in Britain and certainly in the United States, to have forgotten many of the lessons of what happened in the 1930s and 1940s, which was, I'm arguing, to do with the, the lack of democratization of knowledge and opportunity. Um, Feynman wrote this. He said, yes, we are at the very beginning of time for the human race. It's not unreasonable that we grapple with problems there are tens of thousands of years in the future. Our responsibility is to do what we can, learn what we can, improve the solutions and pass them on. It's our responsibility to leave the, he said men of the future actually, but we'll forgive him that in the 1950s, <laughs> that the people of the future a free hand. In the impetuous youth of humanity, that we can make grave errors that can stunt our growth for a long time. This we will do if we say we have the answers now so young and ignorant, if we suppress all discussion, all criticism, saying, this is it, boys, man is saved, and thus doom man for a long time to the chains of authority, confined to the limits of our present imagination. It's been done so many times before. It is our responsibility, knowing the great progress and great value of a satisfactory philosophy of ignorance, the great progress that is the fruit of freedom of thought to proclaim the value of this freedom, to teach how doubt is not to be feared but welcomed and discussed, and to demand this freedom as our duty to all coming generations. Very powerful piece of writing in the 1950s, but I think, I think one thing I would say about institutions like this is that they, um, they exist for times like these. That's the, I think that's the key point. So it seemed like in the 1950s there was the, the, the echo of the problems that were created in the 30s were still very vivid. We've got complacent. I think we were complacent in Britain. Uh, they were, they're certainly complacent in America at the moment. And I think that the, it's worth us remembering that we are the people <coughs> who carry that torch, not only as the elite, as I said in Sagan's vision of the elite in a walled institution, a walled university, but also as people who have the um, I suppose it's mandated, we are mandated to democratize the knowledge that we've been lucky enough to acquire. But thank you very much. Thank you. It's a great honor. And um, I think we're going to have a, a long Q&A session in the chat. But thank you. Thanks so much for accepting the award. It's a pleasure to have you here. And thanks for your insightful speech as well. So as, as the professor mentioned, we're going to be moving into a question and answer session. I'm going to get the ball rolling and ask a few questions. And then we'll open it up to the audience. So maybe get thinking of your questions now while I'm asking mine. Uh, but the first question is just touching on some of the, uh, some of the things you said in your speech. Uh, we're, like we're living in a world uh, where Brexit is reality. And we saw that a strong majority of the scientific community in, in the UK believed that the UK was best to remain in the EU. Um, so why, why do you think this was the case, and what do you think the impact is going to be on the scientific community uh, from Brexit? Um, I mean, the, the second part of the question is impossible to answer at the moment, because um, we, we, as with every other sector of the economy, we have no idea what that means. The same, I think, here in Ireland, no idea what it means with the, the border even, for example, fundamental questions like that. And in some sense, and I know a lot of my colleagues are rather... Uh, in some sense, reticent. To, there, are, there, are bi there are big problems um, which need to be solved, and uh, and in some sense, perhaps the the needs of the scientific community uh, feel at least to be lower down. 
uh, on the list. Um, I, I was involved in an event with our science minister, Joe Johnson, who happens to be the brother of Boris, actually, but couldn't be more different, in fact. <laughs> and um, he, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, we, we talked about the, for us, I think, in the universities, that there is a, there's obviously a funding challenge, but that's really secondary. The, the main challenge is the, the image that we are portraying as a country at the moment since that vote, which is, I think, of a closed country, of a country that's suspicious, not, not only of experts, as I mentioned, but of knowledge, but suspicious of other people from around the world. And that's the most damaging thing. We've spent centuries, as have you here, um, welcoming uh, people from all over the world to come and study and to, to add to the great library of knowledge that we generate. And I, so I think the rhetoric has been even more damaging than the, the reality. But funding comes and goes. Um, and it, it's <laughs> probably going at the moment. With, but uh, th that can always be replaced. But I think your image in the world as, a, as a, an open country can be damaged. And that's what we are most worried about. Um, and then my next question is just um, touching on, I saw you had an interview on Australian TV in August where you were arg arguing with the Senator Malcolm Roberts about climate change. And like, despite the strong scientific evidence uh, showing that <laughs> climate change is, uh, has, is caused, by, uh, caused by humans, uh, we still see people deny that and uh, say that it's just a natural occurrence. Um, and now we have, as you mentioned in your speech, we have a climate change denier going to the White House in January. So what, what do you think it's going to take for climate change deniers to be turned? Is it going to have to be some kind of disastrous event? Or is there any way to kind of, I don't know, explain to them that this mm -hmm. is, is real and this is happening? It's, it's one of the, the, I think the key problem we have with, with climate change is it, by the time real disastrous events come along, it's, it's not necessarily too late, but it's becoming increasingly expensive to, to solve the problem. And, and so it's often said that what we do by inaction now is load an immense debt onto future generations um, because it, beco it becomes less and less, less and less, oh, actually, m well, more and more expensive to solve the problem. I mean, but although you see now, I mean, the, the, the Arctic ice data from this year, which you see widely reported actually, is quite frightening. It's taken a lot of people by surprise. Now, it's probable that that's a, uh, I was reading an article today on it actually, it's probable that, it's, that there are significant variations from time to time, but it's an extremely worrying, um, the, the, I think the temperatures are of order 20 degrees warmer than they would normally be on average in the Arctic. Um, now, I don't think anyone expects it to stay like that. It should fall back again next year and the year after, you hope. But th that would be a disastrous event. That would mean that climate change is, is upon us much faster than we thought. So I, so I, I think I, I struggle to. We, we, you mentioned this. I don't know if you saw this thing. I mean, he's th this guy is a very famous um, sort of strange <laughs> member of the Australian Senate. Actually, so he's got very strange <laughs> ideas. Um, but I don't know what it takes to convince people like that because they genuinely believe that there's a there's a conspiracy. He said on air. This is essentially. Um, You'll have a, a question time, but what's your, the, the political sort of question time? We have question time in the UK anyway, which is the political debate yeah, show like every prime week. time on or TV or so yeah. I mean, this was Everything that show, so it's not, a, it's not kind of some random sort of it's daytime show. And, and, and the fact that those people um, would, he said lie that he thought there was a conspiracy between NASA and between the United Nations and between uh, the, the Australian oh. government. And, and, and that mindset, is I think what I was trying to allude to in the, in the few remarks that I made is, is how do you address that? It's, it's not, I think, and, and we would be wrong to think it's because people who express those opinions are, are somehow, you know, have a low IQ or something like that. It's not that at all. It's, it's the fact that um, ed, you have to be taught to think analytically, I think. As, as well, students, you would, you would know that. It, it's not something that comes naturally. I think the idea to to overvalue one's own opinion is, is probably innate. It's probably the, the, the way that we are. And the, 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 for me, the key purpose of education is to, is to show, is, is to teach humility in that respect. It's obviously the basis of the scientific um, endeavor, the scientific method is, is that you, you're delighted to be wrong. 
but why are you delighted to be wrong? Because when you're wrong, you've learned something. And mo professional scientists spend their careers being wrong most of the time. The, the odd time that you're right, you tend to get a promotion or an award or something <laughs> like that. You know, but it's very rare. Um, but the point is that it's whether you, I think that, I think the point is whether you value, what, uh, how, what is your, your self-image, what, what is it? Is it to be, do you value being seen to be right, which seems to me to be um, a, a trait that's present in many, but not all, but many of our politicians. They want to be seen to be right. Or, or is it actually um, learning something? Uh, because if you value learning, then being wrong is as valuable as being right. Um, but if you value this this idea that you're a, you know, a, a great a great politician whose instincts are always right, you know, and we, we see those people. I think Donald Trump is an example of one of those people. Then then that's where you you lose track. Um, I think so. Yeah, Malcolm Roberts is an interesting. I mean, for, for a real for an elected a democratic elected politician in a, in a highly educated country. Um, rich country like Australia to, to propose on national television there's a conspiracy between the United Nations, NASA and the Australian government is just bizarre. So how can you, yeah. how can you get to that point? And do you think he's being paid off by big oil companies? Or is <laughs> <laughs> do I think it's a conspiracy? <laughs> or is it I don't know. <laughs> Probably not. You know, I mean, I met him um, before the show and, and he, um, he, he, had a, he said his son was a, was a fan of my documentaries. He, he's trained as an engineer actually, so it's, it's interesting how you get to that position. So, so no, I don't, I don't think there's, the, the, there's anything to it in that sense. I think it's just a very, um, you, you meet, I meet these people, you must meet these people who are very, very sure of their own judgment. It's kind of a, you know, I know irrespective of what those things are, I, I, I have some insight into knowledge and that, that's what we're fighting, I think. And then just my last question, uh, before we head up to the audience, but, um, just like to know on your decision to go from um, academic science and research into uh, popular science and communicating science and how, how you kind of made that journey and, and why you... I didn't make a did decision it. actually. I get asked it a lot because there might be some of you in the audience, uh, the, many of my students, because I, st I still teach, I teach first year physics at Manchester this, this, this term actually. And uh, I do get asked quite a lot, how would you go into something that you do? And then um, everyone I know who's ended up making television or radio or writing books didn't intend to do that. They, they all, I, if you do a PhD, you choose to do a PhD, I think it's the, writing a thesis is the most difficult thing that you ever do, but also the most rewarding, for, partly for that reason actually. It's incredibly difficult to finish a PhD and write it up and then defend it. And um, so I think anyone who does that is, is doing, is, has chosen that path because they love doing science, they love finding things out. Or, well, indeed not only science, but in any academic discipline. Um, and so, given that, I think everyone, uh, I was relatively reluctant to do it. It was, it was almost a mistake in a way. I mean, well, not a mistake, but it was, I was at CERN and I was involved in a, an upgrade project on the Large Hadron Collider. And um, the BBC came and wanted to make a documentary. And this is way before the Large Hadron Collider was switched on. <coughs> and I was just one of the British postdocs there. Um, so they said, well, can we interview you? And I said, yes, okay. And, and then they quite liked that and interviewed me again and then said, do you want to make a, we have a documentary s series called Horizon now, which was sort of 10 or 15 years ago. It was a very easy thing to do. So, so we made one of those. And then it sort of fell into it accidentally. And I, I, I think that's probably the only way that it can be. Um, and then you realize that actually, as I've tried to outline, it becomes, I think it's becoming increasingly valuable for, for many of us that are, that are working in academic subjects, uh, places like this, to democratize knowledge. And so afterwards you look back and say, well, it is a, it's a valid career path actually. And in fact, at the University of Manchester now, we uh, recently, because of our, our push from the, the last two vice chancellors actually, who both really firmly believe this, um, the, the promotion structure through the university, the academic promotion structure, now has, they used to call it the three-legged stool, which is a ridiculous sort of thing, but it, but it, was, it was always, you get promoted, you have, a, you have um, admin, teaching and research. And now it's admin, teaching, research and social responsibility, that's what they call it in Manchester. So that would be, for example, um, disseminating your knowledge to, to, the, to the wider public. So th these are, it's increasingly important, I think, <coughs> as I said, that we, we don't retreat within the, the walls of the academy. 
um, for, for all the reasons that we can see and for the reasons that this happened so many times, as, as Carl Sagan <coughs> put his finger on beautifully, um, when you do that, the, the barbarians do come to the gates, ultimately, and uh, there's no one there to defend it. Okay, thanks so much. Um, so that's it for me, but we're gonna open up questions from the audience, so if anyone has any questions, you can raise your hand. Yeah. Can people? I didn't hear the first bit. Which how what do people? <laughs> do you want to stand up just for? Is there a high barrier? <laughs> yeah, it's um, th there's a. I think one of the things again. Um, th th Two answers. If I just wind back a bit, because it occurred to me, one of the, the other things Carl Sagan wrote a great book called The Demon Haunted World, Science the Candle in the Dark. And so that the reason we would want people, as many people as possible, everyone ideally, to understand a bit about the process of, of, of science, the, the process, what we might loosely call the scientific method, there are many different definitions of it. One of the reasons is that because we live in democracies, in a civilization, in societies that are increasingly based on the outputs of science and engineering. So as Sagan wrote in the 80s, democracy can't work if you have a population that loses respect <coughs> for science uh, and academia in general um, and uh, is unable to understand a, a way different statements between different, the, the, I mean, he wrote that in the 80s when the, the web wasn't there. So, so the, the, it's, it's so much more problematic now being able to differentiate between, a, if we say, talk about climate change, the, the, the opinion of experts, which is a dirty word now in, in the UK, at least, um, and, uh, and the opinions of all sorts of other people who think there are conspiracy theories, etc. So that's the, the reason we need to do it. Um, I, I, I think, I've just been involved in a project with the Royal Society in, in Britain to film science experiments in primary schools. And there's a big push now to get experimentation back into primary <coughs> schools and fund it properly. This is, this is at the age of six, seven, eight years old. Because it, I think it's in doing science that you begin to understand how to weight the conclusions of it. It's when you've seen, when you've actually done yourself. It, it, we did an experiment yesterday that it was a bunch of six and seven year olds and they were filtering water uh, through different things. But they'd been given the task of what do you want to filter the water through? Uh, do you want to do it through sand or, or filter paper or what do you think will work best? And then they went out and did their experiment themselves. And this is six-year-olds. So you can teach even five, six, seven-year-olds to, to do that. And I think that they, first of all, they loved it. They were very enthusiastic. But secondly, I think they remember that process. And then when somebody says, you know, I've used a supercomputer to simulate the, the, what, the, uh, what the climate may be like in 100 years' time, then you remember that actually, well, it's, it's actually no different really from the little experiments and things that I did when I was at school. So I think it has to be in schools, actually. And that's a long-term solution. Um, <coughs> but I think a lot of us fear now that there probably is a, a generation of people um, who, who've been lost. Um, it's very difficult, I think, to sort of convince a belligerent 50-year-old belligerent <laughs> that, their, that their opinion might be, might be wrong. But of course, that's the... The heart of the heart of science. This is, I keep saying science, but I do want to emphasise it's really the heart of academia. And this applies whether it's history or the arts or social science, whatever it is. Okay. And any other questions? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can do that. <laughs> I probably should do it. Um, all right, go on. <laughs> and, and I'll answer the question. Thanks. What was your name? Sorry. Yeah, it's Harry. <laughs> Harry. Harry. <laughs> talk, talk, talk amongst yourselves. Yeah. Thank you. Very much thank you. Um, the, the greatest human achievement. Um, I mean, <laughs> take me. <laughs> One of the 
the, the, one of the most difficult things I think we've we've done. If you're talking just te technologically, one of the most difficult things is is the Large Hadron Collider, and I mention that because specifically because that island, I know it's in the document, the 2020 vision document for for, for island to join CERN, um, and that would be a a wonderful thing to do for many reasons. And I should say CERN was was um, 1953, 1954, I think it was funded, uh, founded, and it was founded out of, literally out of the, the ashes of the Second World War. It was founded so that European nations would collaborate together uh, for <coughs> a, a, to, to generate new knowledge for peaceful means. And it's called, the, the N stands for nuclear. It was the, the, the Nuclear Research Association at the time. Um, but that, that was the point of the thing, to bring nations together for the peaceful advancement of knowledge. So I, it would be, I, I think it would be a, a wonderful thing if Ireland joined. I hope uh, there's a big push. And actually a few of my colleagues have said that it, it needs a push now in, in, in Irish politics just to, for, for the government to see that it's a thing that would be a v valuable and valued by, by, by enough of the population to do it. But I think it's on the agenda. But if you look at the LHC, it's, it's a colossally complicated machine and the, the idea the fact that we build it actually as a civilization uh, which is purely to, to go and, and investigate things that seem at the moment to be utterly esoteric and in inverted commas useless this is it's absolutely blue, sky, blue skies research is, uh, is I think a wonderful thing you look at this thing it's 27 kilometers in circumference I mean it generates up to 600 million collisions per second in each one of those, it recreates the conditions that were present a billionth of a second after the Big Bang. And we're able to photograph those collisions. We're able to extract precision measurements. We discovered this, the, the, the Higgs particle. It was, it was a remarkable discovery. Um, I mean, the idea, the basic idea is that you have a, as the universe expanded and cooled, um, something, it, it, one way to look at it is it condensed out into empty space. So, so empty space I is not empty. It's filled with this thing called the Higgs field. So you almost visualize it as Higgs particles, if you like. And it's through the interaction with that field that we get our mass at the most fundamental level. So if you look at the electrons in the, in the, around the atoms, in the atoms in your finger, those things are getting their mass by interacting with this field that condensed out into the universe a billion, less than a billion per second after the Big Bang. The fact that we developed that picture Theoretically, first, we're talking about 1960s theoretical physics um, and, and honed <coughs> it over the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and then discovered it with this machine, which is arguably the most complex machine we've ever built, um, and found it. Found it's, it's one of the most remarkable um, examples of what the physicist Eugene Wigner called the, uh, the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in the physical sciences, the fact that you can make such a prediction. And uh, actually, my friend Robin Ince, who's, who's with me tonight, actually, we didn't show tonight, we had a radio program the, called The Infinite Monkey Cage with, he has a, a sort of comedy routine where he says, imagine Peter Higgs doing that, where, where you know, that, that someone says, Peter, we, we built this machine, it's the most complex machine anyone's ever built, cost billions of dollars, 27 kilometers under Switzerland and France, and it's to, it's <coughs> to prove that your theory is right. And uh, I hope you're right, Peter. <laughs> you know, then Peter Higgs goes, uh, oh no, I forgot to carry the one. Oh no, they've started digging. <laughs> so it's kind of quite, uh, it's, quite a, it's, an, it's, it's, a, it's a remarkable thing, I think. For, for, for that reason as well, for the reason that it was built, there is no obvious, there will be a practical use to that knowledge. There's always, always a practical use to knowledge at some point down the line. It's one of the reasons that we do fundamental research. Um, but the idea that you would build it without being able to say to, to politicians, um, th th this is what's going to do. It's going to lead to better something or something. It, it did. I mean, I, sh I should say that CERN, you know, obviously, famously, the World Wide Web was invented at CERN. Tim Berners-Lee has said he didn't think it could be invented anywhere else because of the particular challenges that were there in the 80s and 90s in terms of data sharing. Um, but also medical imaging technology, particle beam therapies for cancer that are coming through now, all that stuff is offshoots from particle physics. However, you don't, it's explicit that we don't do it for that. And that's why I think it's one of the great achievements as well. Okay, and then we'll do questions.
Um, it's a, as I said, I, I do think and it's that, that it's, it's about <coughs> at the level of primary and secondary education. I, I think it has to be. It has to be in that framework. Um, it's very much more difficult for someone, as I mentioned, in their 30s, 40s, 50s, when they've gone through the education system, <coughs> to go back. And um, we, we try to do that. I think the media plays an important role, actually. I mean, of course, in, in Britain, we're lucky to have, although it's a, in retreat to some extent, we're lucky to have the BBC, which is a, a national institution um, who's a, whose purpose is to act in the interest of the country and secondly, to be a media organisation. Now, it's the same here, isn't it? It's, um, it's uh, what the, the public broadcaster. The RTE. RT, RT, yeah. that's right. So again, you, you have this most valuable thing that, that can, uh, may, it won't do as, as in, in the same way the BBC doesn't as much as it should, but <coughs> can act as that, that conduit for knowledge. Um, but I think it has to be, it, th there's a great book actually, um, something that Max Tegmark wrote, he's a really interesting physicist, um, I'm trying to remember the, I'll remember the name in a minute, but he made the same point in that book recently, which is that the, the, the easiest thing to do is to change the way that we teach science in school. Um, make it more in the, in the spirit of this, this society, actually. It's a, the, the idea that it's about challenge, it's about debate, it's about subjecting all knowledge to scrutiny, it's about being suspicious, but, on, but there's a balance. It's not only about being, it's not, th this word skeptic is misunderstood now. It's, it's not about being suspicious about everything. So anyone who's, you know, NASA, be suspicious about them, they didn't land on the moon, all that kind of stuff. That's not being a skeptic. There's, there's, a, there's a level of, there's, there's, there's informed skepticism. And then there's knowing when to accept something as, as more likely to be right than wrong. So I, that has to be to me at, at school. I don't see an easy way to do it for societies as a whole, but in the medium term, you can imagine that it would filter through. Any other questions? Um, yeah, coming up. Um, so you mentioned about the cost of the travel for global women and children, and there seems to be this trend in the scientific community that uh, like there is a problem with sort of cost and, and distribution, and computer science how <coughs> it's grown so significantly over the last number of decades because the discoveries are profitable. Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I mean, I've been on, you know, funding panels where we try very hard not to um, sort of get in, get institutionalised, I suppose. And and it's one of the criticisms of a big science project. I don't share this criticism. One of the criticisms of um, somewhere like CERN is that that once it's there, and once once you have a, 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 <coughs> a national commitment to it, protected by international treaty, actually then uh, it's very easy for funding for, for other branches of science to shrink, especially when, when there's pressure on funding. And that's <coughs> one of the arguments for not going into these big research projects. Um, the the, the counter-argument is that they're extremely efficient um, because, in the case of CERN, you have 80-odd countries um, participating in the, the one place in the world where you can do that science. And that, that makes it very cheap on a national basis. But it also means that you have 88 countries collaborating together, which is one of the most valuable things. But um, you're right, we always have to be vig vigilant because science, as with any other human pursuit, is an institutional pursuit. And um, the, the, all you can be is aware of the fact that to, to make big shifts in, in, in funding direction as a country is always controversial. Not only in science, but in any area. There's, there's an immense amount of inertia <coughs> in, in science, as with every other human pursuit, I think. Uh, I don't have an easy answer, other than people have to, have to be aware of that. And, and, and the, 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 the structures that we set up to distribute funding have to be, have to be flexible and cannot just reward uh, institutional inertia as well. We can have debate. It, uh, it's probably the same in, in Ireland. I mean, you, we're in the, the great... University of Ireland. So the, the argument, I'm sure, among some of the um, universities outside of Dublin would be that, the, that there's so much inertia that the funding goes to these centres of excellence that there's no space for new centres of excellence to grow. And it's the same in every country in the world you have those debates. <coughs> um, so there's no easy answer to that other than to be aware of it, I think. Any other questions? Um, 
Yeah, you can read one. I don't, he's, he's proposing what? To cap? So the current bill has passed the Justice Department of Education, wants to take the cap from gender studies and math and science at the end of the cutoff. So I'm not voting. <laughs> 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 but it was terrifying and very incredibly wrong. But how do we combat that in not being able to have enough kids already in the school system to in charge of things? But how, what is your thoughts on this? And how can we combat this kind of like this? I mean, of course, <laughs> of course, I think everyone's grappling. No, no, Trevor, everyone's grappling with these problems. I mean, we have the. I don't think. I mean, we have similar problems in in Britain. Fr France may end up with a similar problem. Uh, that we we see that in the European democracies, there's this drift towards populism, uh, and populism in the. You know, uh, it, some people point out that, that that's not in itself problematic. It goes back to the previous question, actually. How do you? You, you always should test the inertia in our systems and see whether if you're leaving too many of the population behind, which is what we seem to have done economically and educationally, then w what is populism other than the democratic will of the people trying to shake things up? So I think I do think we've got a lot to, uh, uh, you know, people who might say that, that, that as, as I would, like Donald Trump and Nigel Farage and those movements are, are, are problematic. We, we also have to, I think, bear some blame for it in the fact that we've not democratized knowledge but maybe and, and that comes to my answer which is i think it, it it's boring in a way isn't it it must be it must be education both 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 quality of education and access for everyone and and i i think it's surely the case in america where I, you, know, you look at the statistics that there surely is a, a large fraction of the population that's been failed by the school system and then you open you have to be taught to think. I think go back to something I said earlier. I, I just don't think it's it's innate to be able to sit there, even to put yourself in someone else's position. There's the um, I've forgotten the name of the, the philosopher. Someone will, someone will answer because we're in the philosophical side. The, it, it's a recent philosopher. I'll remember in a minute. But um, he said that um, one of the tests of a, of a of a fair society, a just society is you could imagine yourself swapping places with somebody else in that society. And yes, if, if you're a millionaire and you ended up going swapping with someone who's on the minimum wage, you would notice a difference. But would you feel that it, th the society was unfair when you switched? Um, would, or, or would you feel as yourself that you could go from this position, then I can, if I want to apply myself, I can make the way. I, I'm aware that there's an oversimplification there because my position now is one who's fortunate enough to have had a, a lot of education and spend a lot of time thinking about things. But I think that broad idea that you could imagine switching places with someone and then looking out on that society and saying, does it look fair now? Does it look like I have equal opportunities? That's a really powerful way of thinking. But you have to be taught that. So that would be the very, as, as President Higgins said, actually, the, one of the great benefits of teaching philosophy in schools at a young age would be you would be exposed to ideas like that and it might just be in your mind and that's obviously if you said to donald trump you know well just think about it for a moment what, what if you uh, you swap places with a woman in the society and you'd be one of the people that can't get into university because of the cap on on that or, or you couldn't go into business because what what's the implication your family life or something like that what is it you should be at home looking after the kids you, you swap and just that one piece of education in his mind might make him think, well, actually, no, it's not, <laughs> it's not entirely right, is it, Rob? Yeah, so it's kind of a two-minute question. Um, right at the back. Um, yes, yeah, so the devaluing of arts as well. Yes, I, I think so, and we see that. I don't know about the situation in Ireland, but we see in Britain for, for many years now, uh, government has focused on the sciences and engineering, but but as as drivers of economic growth purely, rather than 
as I think we're seeing now, um, part of part of the means by which citizen, you, you build a stable society. Because to go back to that point, I really believe that that citizens have to be taught how to think, and that's that's it doesn't matter to first order whether that's although philosophy is the study of that I suppose so that's why it's worth focusing on but it doesn't matter whether it's in the context of history or English literature or whatever it is I think it's just that process of being taught how to think to take different perspectives and crucially I think to understand that being wrong is, is a positive thing to be and changing your mind I mentioned that but the, the I think the ability to change your mind is probably something you have to be taught um, and so that 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 any yeah so, so if the center of your question is is a focus on particular areas which seem to just be areas which would deliver short-term economic growth uh, is that right I would say no for this reason that what we're seeing now is that the our societies that the stability of society is now at stake I, I, I don't know whether I mentioned it, but I'd said but last week, and it got picked up in the UK, I, I think education now is, is a national security issue. Like you could see it like that through that prism. Because what we're seeing is our, you, you tend to think of societies like ours becoming unstable because of external influences. And so let's build a load of submarines and make sure they don't come in. When actually, the, the, our societies are being destabilized from within because of a, a lack of the democratization of knowledge. Yeah, I've only time for one or two more questions. Um, I was just here, yeah. Uh, 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 what? So uh, I really don't, um, I don't know, because my, my kind of response, my, my, my innate response, and, and some people have said to me, it's because I come from a place called Oldham, which is just outside Manchester, which is, a, and my innate sort of feeling is just to take the piss, because that's, <laughs> I think it's just like, kind of a, um, you know, it comes out every now and again, I can't help it, you know, but, but I, it's probably counterproductive, that, and, and so, I mean, it's, I mean, people have done a lot of work on this, of course, but I, I don't think there's an easy answer. The, what one of the, I mean, there is certainly true that people who believe in one tend to believe in more than one. That's clearly shown to be true. And um, th I think I saw a worrying statistic the other day that at least, I think it's something like 65% of Americans, and that was just because the study was done in America, it's not picking on them. I think 65% believe in at least one conspiracy theory. And then once you believe in one, you're more likely to believe in more than one. And, and, it, and it might be a harmless conspiracy theory. They're often surrounding, you know, the, you know, but maybe things you could almost see as a you know, big farmer or big agriculture. And, thing. and there are problems with the way that those industries um, run themselves, that, uh, but they're, they're not global conspiracies. So, so it, it, it's your, your question, it's kind of funny, but it's also a, it's one of the central problems we have. When the more than half the population in democratic societies believe in at least one conspiracy theory, and therefore probably many, how do you, how do you bring reason back into it? So I think it's probably the most one of the most important questions in the that we have today. Actually, how do you deal with these people? I mean, the, you know, I deal with the, the flat Earth people who tweet on, on Twitter <laughs> all the time. <laughs> it's going, how can you think the Earth? But they really believe it, and they become very abusive very quickly, which is a common thing in conspiracy theories. And, and in the end, I said to one of them tweeted me a few weeks ago and said, uh, said, why, why do you keep saying the Earth is round? It's not round. It's not why you do. And I and I tweeted back saying, oh, it's, it's because NASA give me a million pounds a year. <laughs> so, but this, this, person, this person then put that on one of their message boards uh, as a, and, and they're all going yes yeah, see so it's definitely <laughs> flat so you can't so taking the piss is not necessarily the best solution they just believe they believe it so I mean if you can't I mean it's really I think it's not one thing I would say it's not about the specific issue because of course it's, it's so easy to show the earth is flat you know, it's just, it's just <laughs> so, but yet, but the, I've not seen one of these people um, be, be uh, and, and there are a lot of them, be convinced by anything that anybody says. And so it's, it w so it's something else. It's not about the specific issue. I think that's a key, the thing that I've begun to realize. It's not that there are 
as I said, there are some people, you could imagine saying, well, there's a, there's a global conspiracy of um, um, big agricultural companies. And it, you, some of us might even think you can see it, and maybe there's some, you know, maybe they don't behave quite as well as they should. But actually, ultimately, that's probably no different <coughs> to saying that the Earth is flat or we didn't land on the moon or something, because it becomes impossible to, to bring reason or evidence into the argument. So I'm not really sure what the, what the answer is. You, how do, what do you do? do you uh, <laughs> I always think that, I mean, it, with the aliens building the pyramids, I, I, I had that as well. And, and that, I said, look, if, 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 the, if someone opened the pyramid up and they found just one like, titanium screw or some, <laughs> something that couldn't have been there, you know, then, then, then you would think, oh, that's kind of interesting. Um, but, uh, the, of course, there's zero evidence. <laughs> and we might have time for just one more question. Um, I mean, it's um, there's several things to say because I I, um, I gave a talk at a, a school big schools event in in London relatively recently. It's at two thousand um, students there, and they're they're from it's London, so they're all backgrounds and all all faiths and non odd, you know, just really wonderfully diverse audience. And that, that was the first question I was asked was something on similar lines. It was and this is a sort of fifteen year old or something said, is it possible to be religious and be a scientist? And, and I thought for a moment, and I said, yes. And I, was, I have a comma there, which I'll talk about in a minute, however. But uh, when I said yes, I got a round of applause, big round of applause, 2,000 kids. And I thought, actually, the, uh, people like me have to be careful because, because of course, you, you find your own accommodation with these questions. There'll be, there'll be, there was certainly children in that audience, you know, 14 year olds, 13 year olds, who would come from really deeply religious backgrounds. And, and so the, the idea that someone like, someone like me would, would say, well, no, you can't, you, I, I will set up a conflict between you and your parents or you and your, your, your community or whatever it is, you know, it is entirely wrong. Um, the people, the, the point which I made afterwards uh, was that, that you, you will, let's say you decide to be uh, an evolutionary biologist. And uh, because you find it interesting, but also you're from a religious background, y you might find an accommodation. Your accommodation might be to, to jettison your religion, or it might not be. It might be that you find a way through. There are scientists who, who work, uh, and cosmologists in particularly, who, who, who s are able to hold these simultaneous views. Uh, Georges Lemaitre, who is a, a Belgian Catholic priest, um, one, of the, one of the great cosmologists who worked with Einstein, um, and uh, Friedman on the, the initial, not, not with Einstein, but at the same time on the transformation of Einstein's theory of general relativity into a theory of cosmology. And um, he was the first to take very seriously the idea that the, in his words, he said to Einstein, your theory suggests there was a day without a yesterday. Because he was taking theory that seriously the solution to Einstein's equations of an expanding universe, which is one of the solutions in the equations. It's, just, it's an amazing thing. A theory of gravity will lead you without any assumption other than the fact that matter is distributed uniformly across the universe to, to show that the universe is dynamic, so it's always changing. And, and so but he was the Einstein wanted an eternal universe, it seems, at the time. Uh, Lemaitre, because of his he was a Catholic priest, I think, so he thought, well, if it's expanding, it must have been smaller in the past, so therefore there must have been an origin, and he was delighted with it, um, and so he, because he felt it was, you know, it, there was his prejudice being a, and, and, uh, and he was right, actually, <laughs> so, but um, he, he said once, he was asked, how can it be that you can be a cosmologist and a priest, and he said, there are two roads to the truth, and I choose to take them both, <laughs> which I don't think <laughs> <a> good answer, <laughs> um, but, uh, but the, the key point, I think, is, is that, um, so yes, of course, the, if you're, let's say, a, a young earth creationist, and so you think that the world's 6,000 years old, it just isn't. And there's nothing much you can say about that. And I said that to this audience afterwards. You know, so there are, it, it, I, I suppose you end up in a theological debate then about the, uh, how, to, 
how literally you should take your religious text. And that's not my, that's not in, I, I'm not involved in that at all. So, so I'm, I'm always quite careful in answering those questions because I don't want, I, I want the individual, particularly if it's a 13 or 14 year old, to, to make their own mind up and not, not, not do science. Don't, don't decide you can't do science because you think there's a conflict. Because someone told you there was a conflict, uh, you know, find it out for yourself. It's really important that. But of course, <laughs> maybe the sense of your question is, what you know, what do you do to, how do you deal with people? Because I do, <coughs> being in, in the public eye, you know, people will say, well, I, I think the world's six thousand years old. And all you can say then is, well, no, it isn't. I mean, there's not a lot you could say. I mean, I can't really say anything else other than it isn't. <laughs> it's four point five four plus or minus whatever it is, <laughs> year, billion years old. Uh, yeah, I unfortunately think that's all we have time for. Uh, Brian, I'd like to thank you so much for coming and for accepting our award. I'm just going to ask everyone to stand and give uh, Brian a final round of applause. <laughs>